Okay, welcome everyone to the Creating Through Grief panel. We are so excited to get started and feature our panelists. Before we begin, I wanted to create a space for the Scholastic Awards staff to briefly introduce themselves. My name is Hadel. I am the New York City Scholastic Awards Manager and an alum of the awards. I received the gold key and gold medal uh, in 2008 for my poetry. And I'm also the Nagaro Bronx Poet Laureate. Um, if Dina and Laura would like to briefly introduce themselves. Hi everyone, my name is Dina Abdelhadi. I also work for the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards as a scholarship coordinator. So I help to make sure that programming like this in support of our scholarships um, happens and is available to y'all. I'm also an alumni of the Scholastic Awards, also from 2008 uh, for a journalism piece, but I mostly do poetry now. And I was a Brooklyn Poets Fellow this past year. I will introduce, uh, pass it over to my colleague, Laura. I'm a development manager here at the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers. So I work with groups like the New York Life Foundation to create scholarship opportunities for students within the awards. Um, and I'm not an alum, but I'm very excited that you could all join us. Awesome. Thank you for those brief intros. I will be your MC for tonight. So there are a couple of housekeeping items I want to go over before uh, we begin to ensure we have a great time tonight. Um, the first thing is uh, we will be providing a brief intro to the awards, uh, but please make sure to keep things on topic in the chat. We'll have a separate Q&A session for how to apply for scholarships after the panel has ended. So please hold those questions for the end. Also, we want you all to support the writers during their reading in the chat. Please make sure to shout out phrases that really stuck to you, uh, things that really uh, touched your heart. We are a community of writers, so we definitely want to make sure to show love. Um, additionally, one of my personal mantras is don't yuck my yum, so something that may uh, be amazing for somebody else, may not necessarily be appealing to you, but please don't yuck anybody's yum. Um, also, you can turn on closed captions for this event by clicking a button that says CC at the bottom of your screen. If you're watching this on a smaller screen, you can access the captions by looking for three dots and selecting the option to turn on closed captioning. Uh, also, please add questions for panelists in the Q&A box. As you think of them, we will make sure to turn to them after uh, we cover some of the questions that we have planned for tonight. Uh, lastly, uh, thank you so much to the New York, New York Life Foundation for making this panel possible. We're hosting this panel in honor of Children's Grief Awareness Month. You can find more about this initiative and get resources by visiting their website, which will drop in the chat. To go over quickly uh, a little bit about the awards, uh, the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards have been around for nearly a century. We are uh, the largest source of scholarships for young creative teens. And we are open to teens ages 13 years and older in grades seven through 12 in the US and Canada. Um, we are an amazing organization that unlocks different recognition opportunities for young people at the regional and national level. Uh, we exhibit work across the country and publish um, a select a selection of works in our annual Best Teen Writing and Best Teen Art publications, as well as a variety of different scholarship opportunities that we offer. Uh, we have 28 different categories of art and writing, uh, some of which you all may be interested in applying. Please know our deadlines start as early as December 1st. So if you are a young person between the ages of uh, um, who is 13 years and older in grades seven to 12, we highly encourage you uh, to browse through these categories and submit something soon. Uh, the New York Life Award, uh, which is uh, what we'll be covering a little bit today, um, offers 
six students whose work explores personal grief, loss, and bereavement, a thousand dollar awards, as well as for students in Arizona, Louisiana, Michigan, Mississippi, Montana, New Jersey, New Mexico, Ohio, and Tennessee. We select two students from each of those states uh, to receive an additional $500 award. To get uh, started, we want to make sure that uh, we have enough time for our panelists to speak about their experience. I'm going to introduce our moderator for today. Rachel Alban is an arts educator, writer, and photographer based in Newark, New Jersey. Since 2019, Rachel has been working with the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers to develop workshops for teens and educators that explore how grief and loss can be expressed through creativity. She also develops and leads workshops for Arts Ed Newark, Rutgers University's Paul Rodeson Galleries, Aberrant Arts, Center and other organizations throughout New Jersey and the greater New York City area. Rachel earned her BFA in art education and MPS in art therapy at the School of Visual Arts. Rachel, will you mind taking it away? Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm so happy to he be here with you all and um, to introduce our panelists tonight. Um, and um, then we're gonna move right into hearing some of the readings. Um, so we'll start with Darius. Darius Peckham is an Iranian American poet and an essayist. His work has appeared or is forthcoming in a poem a day, the Georgia Review, Indiana Review, Barrow Street, Michigan Quarterly Review, The Journal, and many others. In 2018, he was selected by the Library of Congress as a national student poet, and then traveled to the Midwest in this capacity to teach middle school and high school age students about the concurrence of grief and joy in literature. Um, he is the author of the chapbook, How Many Love Poems, which is uh, published on Stephen is Seven Kitchens Press. Okay. Thank you so much um, for the introduction and thank you all for having me. Um, yeah, Scholastic's been really good to me uh, uh, as an alumni of the awards and of the National Student Poets Program. Um, and this is something I'm very passionate about. So I'm just very excited for the panel. Uh, I'll be reading two poems tonight. Uh, one, the, this first one is called, Here's a Love Poem to the Garden Snail. I can't remember anything from the moment I was born until the moment they died. It's as if I never really existed, more than some creature left indefinitely by the roadside until boyhood, until they died. So how can I not write love poem after love poem to the people I remember and to the people I don't? There are no heroes in my poems, but if my love poems were to have heroes at all, I'd write instead to the garden snail I once poked and prodded in my box, whose body, glistening, had once intensely entwined itself with another's. As a boy, I could not have known or believed in this long and dangerous lovemaking in the fleshing of one thing to another or in the death of anything of this snail who, in a blink, disappeared into the blackness of a tire's tread, and whose slime in each slow orbit made a trail for me to follow. When I was a boy, I looked at beautiful things as if they were only beautiful in the moment of my looking. This is why I couldn't believe in them. I was like a small, scared god in this way, burst into existence, imprisoned in a warm and good grief, and gladdened by it. I cannot be the hero of my own love poems. I live the way this animal died, a tiny, rapturous ocean stamped relentlessly into its only meaning under the stars. This next poem is called, This is Not the End of the World. In dreams, I am slowly and methodically beating a man senseless. 
are trying to. We all are, all the time. I write the best love poems to the sound of bird calls. Only when I'm far away can I imagine you breathing quietly and dreaming, moving your body a bit. You told me your father would like me with a firm handshake, our mighty paws woven together like men. At the last moment meeting him, my palm maneuvered like a plane into a building. But this is not the end of the world. I will walk further into the music of a few birds and their mating calls to one another before the morning storm. I will forever jog towards that boy on the park path, jumping into puddles and out of them as if traversing hundreds of feet of oceans re-entering the sky and earth. I will always lose, become suddenly like a bullet fired underwater. The wind will work hard at my spine. The joy will make my throat burn with the taste of metal of my mother's throat. Only then will I raise my arms the way runners do at the end of a marathon, the way dancers do at the end of dances, my lips working silently to let go a memory of my father. The sole time his hand rose and fell, he struck me. I was four. Through all this, I've learned only that distance is impossible. At the end of the world, my hands and my body will become limp and feverish, my fist languid as a flower. It will brush against the other man's chin. At the end of the world, I will always be saving somebody. And how wonderful that the first time I met your father, my fingers rested on the tops of his like a lady's at a ball asking politely for a dance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darius. Next, um, I am going to introduce Zelda Godfrey Kellogg. They received a Scholastic Awards gold medal for a nonfiction writing portfolio called The Splintering. She's a recipient of other awards, including those from Young Arts, the Princeton Leonard L. Milberg 53 High School Poetry Prize, the Columbia College of Chicago's Young Authors Writing Contest, um, the Ringledge College Storytellers of Tomorrow Contest. She is a pink haired video game character and also wants everyone to know that she is an eccentric genius. So if she bumps into something and breaks it or forgets your birthday or who you are in general, just know it's all part of her process. So take it away, Zelda. Okay, um, I don't have pink hair anymore and that was a change that happened this weekend. So I'm a black and blue haired actually, uh, a video game character. Um, and also I didn't know that it would, my bio was gonna be read out loud by someone else other than me. So the eccentric genius part, just take that with like a grain of salt. Anyways, I'm done talking. I'm gonna read my work now. Um, this is from, <laughs> this is from uh, yeah, my portfolio uh, this past spring. Um, and it's uh, sort of about my brother, um, sort of about a lot of other things. So I'll get into it. It's uh, called Imprinted. I am sick with anxiety. I shake, I don't do homework. I am inarticulate. I eat one day, the next I don't. I take showers when I take them. I keep my blinds closed. Here, however, meaning this page, I am beautiful. Here, this page, I create. I clean my plate, wash the dishes and take out the trash. I'm alive for one second, then two, then three, then so on, and the shock of it never stops. All there is to know, I realize I no longer know. What do I say? There's food on the table in my poems, and the bad, half bad things happen less and less, or maybe more and more. If I were to enter that conjured Walmart, I would find nothing, which is worse than finding old fear, old anger. I would find nothing to nurse. I am the phosphorus in the lights, and that is all. I go to eat something, and that is all. Dear brother, I have mentioned you. I once watched as your voice grew softer and softer with the bleak tug of a remembrance. RE, death. Now, you talk so much. Have you missed something? Do you miss mom like I do? Are you worried for this country? Are you worried for me? Just like some other sentence, but 
went a little quick. Oh, okay. Are you worried for me? Everyone seems to worry for me. Then the next page. If you, the reader, love your brother, you should mention at some point a small story involving the town the two of you grew up in. You may only know the one story, but nevertheless, share it and emphasize its smallness. Recall the baby alligators lounging on rocks with great detail, spiky, green, beady. They looked like driftwood. And I wanted to know what it felt like to ride a log down a stream, so I tried to hop on top and then ask him if he has any similar stories. He will either share or not share or half share. Maybe at a party and there's a possibility someone interrupts and offers him a joint or a beer, or if you are younger, a stick of gum. There are many situations which may arise. This is to say, today I have decided to make a story of my brother, for my brother. I have made a story and he is in it. He is in it because I have captured him. I've taken the thumb of experience and gotten its print. I have made us here, big in our smallness, small in our bigness, desperately trying to make ourselves over, to push against our own wakes, hoping that many years down the road, we will be able to recognize the tide as it meets the shore. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zelda. Finally, um, I would like to introduce Alexa Russell. Alexa is a junior at Evangel University where she is double majoring in psychology and community relief and development because she is passionate about bringing healing to broken people in broken places. In 2015, Russell lost her younger brother, Kai Andrew to trisomy 13 and has been writing his story ever since. You can find her stories at Written 139 WordPress, and we'll be sure to be share her link. Yes, thank you. And one cool thing that I just want to share um, about being on this panel is today is actually my brother's, uh, would be his sixth birthday. So it's been very special to be invited to be a part of this on this day. Uh, so this poem I'm going to read is called The Flower's Grievance. These words were not written, not scrawled across paper. They were whispered in the wind, the fleeting lullaby of a lily, the drifting of a daisy, an anthem of all forget-me-nots. I grew in a field, open, free, blessed by the breeze. When I first emerged, a sliver of light greeted me, love at first sight. I bask in the warmth, the steady approach of dawn. Never could I have imagined life going wrong. I reached upwards, grasping at kisses of light on my leaves. The sky shone in crimson, then coral and cerulean, a hand-painted declaration of love requited for me. I was your flower, your heart's one desire. And I basked for hours, swaying peacefully in that open field, yearning only for more light. Every second more urgent than the last, I was willing to love no matter the cost to me, a sacrificial love, a noble feat indeed. But that part was easy with my beloved sun at its peak. Then the breezes began to warn me, the creatures scurried with caveats, the crickets chirped and the birds settled down. Violent colors streaked across the sky, twilight threatened, even beckoned. And despite my attempts at being selfless, the light of my life was extinguished and I stood helpless. I endured alone that night. I could only imagine the light the love I once knew, the hope before I grew. Stars glistened, tears like mine. Wolves howled, mournful like me. Oh, how I miss the sun on my leaves. After an eternity, the horizon split. Earth and sky separated before me and something warm swept over the field. Could it be? I didn't dare dream. The sun rose for me, but I recoiled, withered away. I could not bear another broken eternity, a life of loss, a cycle of tragedy. What you ask of me is grief, repeatedly. Not sacrifice from me, but losing you as a permanent possibility to endure frostbitten nights in hopes of catching a glimpse of paradise. And how could I survive your daily descent, descent to the West? How could I sit passively by foreseeing your inevitable demise? How could I continue to flourish in your absence? How could I be a flower without a sun? How could I love, give my all and still lose? Is it worth it to you? And you answered with a teardrop, a single raindrop from the sky. 
It fell straight to the ground, splattered at my root, cleansing me, nourishing me, renewing me. And I knew love is worth it. I, rest, I risk heartbreak with every daybreak, but still I choose you. And I will love you in the darkness, just as I loved you in the light, because grief is the greatest form of love in this life. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much for reading um, your works. Um, they were all very beautiful and moving. And I think one reason that I love doing these panel discussions is because it is such a specialist experience to be able to hear an author read their work um, that I could, I could just listen to you for hours. So thank you for sharing that with us. It really is, is wonderful to be able to receive it. Um, so now I'm going to ask you a few questions and I'd like to start um, by learning a little bit about your process. Um, can you tell us about your creative process? Um, what is going on? Um, how do you come to create your works and uh, what is going on through your, in your mind and in your body during that time? And so I think we should go in the same order. Um, so we'll start with Darius. Okay, yeah. Um, I think I think that my writing about grief specifically began began about like I think when I was 12 and it was kind of just a curiosity um, that I had about my mom who died when I was uh, three years old, um, who was a poet. Um, and so it kind of became this, uh, this way of having a conversation with her, kind of creating a dialogue. Uh, and because of that, I think the, the pressure was really high. And I think I still feel that pressure. Um, you know, when a poem isn't going so well, or it isn't feeling like it's authentic uh, or honest. Um, I think that I get really down and it'll like affect me throughout the whole, like a week uh, <laughs> or whatever, or however long I'm working on this poem. And I think, uh, yeah, but initially, yeah, it, it became this kind of reach or this yearning, this longing for a relationship with my mother that I never uh, got to have uh, when I was uh, growing up. Um, and you know, that kind of morphed into wanting also a relationship with my brother in that space, uh, who, who also died in the same accident when I was three years old. Uh, but yeah, my, um, I think my process began my grief in a certain way. My, my writing process, the, the first time I put kind of pen to paper, I, I was, uh, that was the first time I really, really accessed my grief um, in a tangible way. Uh, so my process has always been connected to my grief, no matter what I'm writing about. Uh, I think my creative process um, now has been trying to figure out how to be okay with uh, my work not maybe uh, becoming something that is perfect. Uh, yeah, uh, but so it's become more of a, a practice, I guess, than like an emotional um, excavation. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that that's um, been helpful and n not so helpful in certain ways. <laughs> so, I, uh, yeah, anyways. Thank you. Thanks so much. And Zelda, can you tell us a little bit about your process? Um, yeah, so, oh, hold on, no string. Um, I started writing about, um, I don't know, I want to say my mom passed away six issues five years now uh and i had always sort of kept a journal when i was a kid but i actually really hated journaling because my mind thought faster than i could write so i hated that um and so i don't journal um and i mean if it works for you great but um i find that um specific uh, like a lot of the times with creative writing it allows me to speak more honestly about my grief in a uh, much more different capacity than um, just talking or journaling or something like that because I'm thinking so heavily about the words that I'm using. Um, and also uh, sort of like what Darius was saying, my 
it has it, it's kind of um been uh an, an idea for me that I was wanting to reject for a long time but that I've now sort of come to accept which is that my work is almost always always relates to grief somehow um and I hated that for the longest time um you know when I first started writing poems uh they were very angry poems they were mainly about like my dad um because my mom passed away and then I didn't have a great relationship with my dad um and then I was like why am I writing these same poems I'm writing these same poems they're just angry they're angry they're not doing anything other than just being really angry um and then it's actually sort of interesting because I I actually do sort of consider genre when when I'm writing about loss so I I find that um and this is obviously subject to change but I find my poetry is often where I explore my relationship with my mom um my nonfiction is where usually I uh, deal with my dad and often my brothers brothers are wonderful I think some of them might be watching I don't know my cousins or something um uh and then my fiction um is something that I've been really trying to work on for about a year or so now but that often I find uh, is not really related to my family a lot, but related to grief elsewhere. So a lot of the times it's like a friend loses their friend. There's like, I don't know, like a divorce or something or a breakup. And um, maybe that's morbid, um, but I also, I also very um, much so enjoy humor um, in writing and not, uh, and I think that I, I can't, I can't envision, especially in my nonfiction, talking about grief without embedding some sort of humor in it not even and it's not even like a uh, and not like an existential like uh this is how life is and isn't that sad it's like I like to um it's in dialogue or in like more subtle ways like I don't like to poke fun at death I don't I don't like to do that but I like to um I like I like to create a sense of levity and so I think that while I do um deal with pretty heavy images and concepts often I find that my work itself is actually a little lighter a little brighter um, just because I like to kind of offset those things and have that balance or juxtaposition if that makes sense that yeah. makes sense the, yeah. the yes the layering quality I can I can totally um, see that in your work it makes a lot of sense thank you and Alexa can you tell us a little bit about your process yeah, so um, I started writing when I was about in sixth grade, and um, I I started entering the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards that year as well. And so my brother was born when I was in ninth grade, and that was the only year between sixth and graduation that I didn't enter anything. I didn't have any um, thing to submit when um, when it opened up in the fall, and I remember talking to my mom about that, like really just distraught because I, I was like, I don't have anything. And she said, it's okay not to have any words right now. And um, the next year on my brother's first birthday, all day we were doing different celebrations and everything like that. Um, but whenever I had the time is whenever I was writing um, my short story, My Elephant and Me, um, which is what was submitted to Scholastic the, that fall and won the New York Life Award. And so my creative, writing process for me most of the time is just I've been thinking and I've been feeling for a long time and I've been processing it internally and then there just becomes a moment where it has to go somewhere and so um I I love metaphors so like I write short stories and to me they're totally real but obviously there's not an actual elephant following me around everywhere <laughs> but they feel so real the metaphor is the only way to explain um, what's going on in my head and in my heart. Um, so a lot of my writing has to do with processing um, not only grief, but just my life and just other deep emotions and things that I'm going through. Um, and a huge part of that process is being able to read the works of other people because um, either um, some really cool fiction piece that I read, read will like challenge me or have some really great image or metaphor in it and that'll send me down a spiral or um, I really love um, other people's biographies and other people's real stories too. Um, just finding that linkage of, oh my goodness, we process grief 
in a totally different scenario at a totally different point in time. Um, but we arrived at the same metaphor. So, um, so that's another really cool thing. Um, but yeah, so my process is just um, a lot of internal work. <laughs> and then um, when the time is right, the words will come. Alexa, thank you so much. And I just want to share with you that um, your, your elephant poem, um, that, that touched me very deeply when I, when I first read it because I went through a similar loss. And um, that uh, metaphor sticks in my head. It stayed with me. Um, so it's really nice to be able to talk to you tonight about that and hear you uh, talk not only about the work that you shared, um, but about, about that one too. Um, so thank you so much. Um, something that I noticed about all three of you is it, you really started writing um, at a young age and you've been working on like sort of in this direction for, for many years, um, I guess. So two part question. One is what would you tell your younger self about your writing or about your experience um, if you can go back? Yeah, I, uh, or, uh, I was going to say we're wrong in the same order, sorry. Oh, <laughs> no, you can go, you can, no, you, no, you can go. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess to avoid yeah. any kind of Zoom chaos, let's stay in the same order. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, uh, I think when I was little, I, I felt some pressure um, to grieve and to write in a certain way uh, that, was acceptable by, I guess, whoever I was talking to. <laughs> um, my grief kind of, uh, before I became like, you know, before I kind of set in stone my own beliefs and about grief and uh, joy. And I, I think these, these beliefs are still, are still developing. Um, but once I, before I kind of had access to my, um, my own kind of sense of a certain amount of like certainty in myself, I and and kind of confidence. I think that I would mirror um, either the way that somebody else was grieving in front of me, or uh, what I thought that they expected um, from a boy who had lost half of his family um, in a car accident. And I think that my yeah, I think I think that my poetry um kind of became that uh for a while and I, I think I I think I felt better writing it in a certain sense because um it was getting out that feeling of mirroring and of um of it, like pressure um but maybe not in the most authentic way that um I think I, I think I was writing towards those those readers or towards those people who wanted uh, to see a certain thing from me, who knew my mom and brother, who um, who have their own grief and kind of were um, projecting a little bit onto me uh, their relationship and memories with them, um, which I, so I think that, yeah, I think a lot of my poems came out very, very sad and kind of um, one note emotionally, not that, I think that you can access a certain different emotion uh, in a poem that, and then like really Kind of hit on that but uh and those there are some great poems like that but i think that um poems that i began to really respect and admire um, as i got older were ones that complicated grief um mm -hmm. and and kind of uh it felt that felt honest to um you know what what we actually feel in grief and what um the different moments and it kind of represented uh these all these different kind of like I don't know, the, these emotional fields um, that that you're experiencing, and one of the poets that was really helpful for me was uh, Ross Gay, um, and his exploration of joy, because I thought it was so interesting that he took. I don't think I don't think a lot of people try to write a happy poem, um, and especially not people who've um, experienced such intense grief as um, as a poet like Ross Gay, who I've uh, who I follow, who I had followed somehow, so it's like it's kind of a personal relationship that I have. Also, I followed since I was 12 years old. I saw I saw a reading of him, uh, reading from him about 
with his first book. And then I kind of watched him develop as a poet. And I was like, holy crap, he's like, somebody can write like that um, and can kind of, and can write um, complicating joy with grief and complicating grief with joy. And, uh, and just having all of that kind of exist concurrently with one another. And I think that's so, I, I just found that so powerful and moving. And I decided that um, that was kind of more so the poet that I wanted to be. So I started writing a lot of poems uh, a lot of love poems to my grief and that's that's one of the first poems that you guys uh heard tonight was and i think I, I really connected with what alexa said at the end of her poem um that um grief is something like grief is one of the most profound expressions of love um and i think that that's absolutely true um and something i learned from Roske. so i very much recommend his work So thanks, Darius. So you talked a lot about how your uh, how your process has changed and things that you've learned along the way. So what's one bit of advice you would give your younger self? Oh yeah, the advice. <laughs> um, That's okay. The advice, I guess. I guess the advice would just be not to worry too much about. I mean, I think I don't know. I I don't. I wouldn't change anything. I feel like I feel like my my process and my experience uh, kind of had to be a certain way, um, just because. I didn't have memories and a conventional kind of way of accessing a relationship mm -hmm. with my mom and brother. Um, and yeah, it's like, I have this anecdote kind of like when I was little, I went to a therapist um, and I only know this because my dad told me about it, but I went to a therapist right after the accident and my dad was like very worried. He's like, oh, there's gonna be all these problems with him. <laughs> you know, uh, he's been through something traumatic. And, um, and then the therapist was like, oh, he, seems like a perfectly normal and happy child uh, you know maybe that's maybe that was true in the moment when I was like playing with toys but I also think that I probably could have benefited from um therapy in a certain way I don't know if um my specific type of like writing that I arrived to would have would have come from that um experience of continuing therapy or uh, how I don't know how that those that relationship would have been so yeah yeah just um, I guess the advice just be trust, trust in the process, the trust in what you're doing. And, That's always um, good advice. It. That's definitely yeah. good advice, especially looking back. Zelda, do you want to share a little bit about how your process has changed since you were young? And what would you tell your younger self? Yeah, I feel like a translation of Darius' advice is also just go to therapy. Like, I feel like <laughs> it's also helpful. Yeah. Um, Pretty good advice. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll kind of start maybe in a similar place, which is where I was and where I am now, and then sort of from there talk about what I wish I knew or maybe the advice that I would have. And so when I was thinking about this question specifically, I, I wrote this down so that I remember it because I have terrible ADHD. Um, but yeah, so there's sort of two things that um, started happening when I first started writing. Also, uh, it's funny that um, you know, I, I recognize now I did start writing at a young age, but when I got serious about it, all of these kids around me and, and you know, this sort of commentary on the young writers world, but they were getting published. They were, you know, winning these awards and something. And I was, I don't know, 15 at the time, 14 at the time. And I thought I was so behind. Um, and that's just not true. <laughs> that's not true at all. Um, not even in the slightest. I don't think Raymond Carver had his first story published until he was like 30, 35. Like, so I just want to throw that out there. That's more for the participants, I feel like. Um, start there. Um, but when I first started writing, like I said, it was these very angry poems. It was very, very angry. And um, I, 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 I do want to acknowledge the fact that, so I went to um, an arts high school and that is a lot of where my training and uh, literally just the actual amount of time that I had on my hands to create work is where that comes from. And I'm very cognizant of that. And I think that a lot of the times the advice is, oh, just write and it'll it'll take you where it's, it's not necessarily true. You need time, you need, uh, you don't need, I don't think you need necessarily formal instruction, but you need, you definitely need a fair amount of time on your hands um, to get better at anything. Um, and where I started was this very angry place. And then that was before I went to this school. And then when I got to this school, I remember my poetry teacher would tell me that my poems had these like 
obsessive quality. They had these very, this just very tense, uh, hyper fixated quality. And it was because, um, and actually I gave a shout out to Jamie Lee earlier in, in the chat and I'm gonna reference something she said the other day, which is that I wanted to get my story right in not necessarily the first time, but in uh, in the medium or the way or with the with the metaphor that I was telling it, I wouldn't change that. I'd be so obsessed with this poem has to work and I have to make it work um, and I can't let it be until it works. And that's not how writing works. Um, I know a lot of people always say, get up every morning, write at 4 a.m. or else you're not a poet. That's, I disagree with that entirely. Um, I, I mean, your own schedule works, but you know, it's recognized, it was for me, uh, what allowed me to process my grief, I think better and uh, start writing in a way that was comfortable for me was when I was, when I could recognize um, my own failure outside of maybe like a workshop lens or maybe like what will other people think about it? it so when I could recognize a failing on my end that was like, I don't like the way that I'm telling this story. I don't like this. And then change and adapt. That was when uh, I felt my work especially open up a lot more. And then the other thing I kind of wanted to talk about just uh, very quickly was I think when I first started writing, um, uh, a lot of the times, and this will is one of my pet peeves uh, and bothers me to no end, is that people would tell me, um, oh, you know, you got your your inspiration from this thing. You, you're, you know, you should in some way be thankful that this thing happened to you. Otherwise you wouldn't have built a career upon it. And that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Um, I hate that so much. And I speak very bluntly because like I said, my work almost entirely deals with grief all of the time. And to be told that, you know, in some way I should appreciate my mom's passing, my mom's death, uh, for this career path that it's handed to me, or or these things is not something I agree with at all. And I and I think that when you're writing about grief, you don't need um, you don't need that lens at all. You don't need to be appreciative of the things that life has handed to you. You do you don't need that. Uh, and in fact, that's where I started. I started out very angry, very very angry. And so my advice is not don't be angry uh, and open yourself up to the verse or whatever. My advice is like, be angry, be very angry because things, bad things shouldn't happen to you. Um, it's bad when bad things happen. Um, and I think, you know, taking things in stride, um, turning the other cheek, that's all great. Um, but that's not realistic. That's not how um, people often, at least initially, react to grief. And so I think it's very important to um, let, to just go through the process. And I know that's sort of what Darius was saying. And, but I think it's, it's a matter of, it's not saying, oh, don't, don't write these angry poems. It's like, you have to write angry poems for about like, I mean, for me, it was like two years, two, three years, uh, which is a long time, but I was doing that by myself, really. I, that wasn't for anyone else. And so once I got, once you move, you're, the thing is you're always gonna move through a range of emotions and that's something I wish I knew. Um, and this is sort of what my mentor was saying, Jamie Lee, that your stories change. So I, I like writing about what I write about now because I've had however much time on my hands and it's not that, it's not that the events have changed or even the way that I perceive them has changed, it's that um, I don't have to write about them angrily anymore because the anger has subsided. Um, and so, yeah, that's just something to think about. Um, if you're if you're stuck writing these poems that you just feel like can't get anywhere, it's like, uh, or that you're writing about the same things over and over, you're gonna be doing that your whole life. And I'm 18 and I say that as an 18 year old, but I know that um, and because that's what every, every professional writer has told me, you're gonna be writing about the same things. So just allow yourself that, allow yourself that, re that, that knee jerk reaction, I think is very important and don't, don't think that you're in the wrong. Yeah. Awesome. Thank, thank you, Zell. So <laughs> I just wanted to respond and say thank you so much. And so much of what you said is very relatable, especially the part about trying to find some 
good and tragedy. There is no good and tragedy, but the meaning that we can find is in the relationship that we had with the person and the the works that we can create and the good deeds that we can do like after, you know, in memory of our person. Um, but I think that is so relatable and also the way that we move through our, our emotions, feeling that anger and, and letting it come and like the transformation process that it happens. So thank you, Alexa. Yeah, so the answer I had written down, I, I hear in both Darius and Zelda's answers. Mm -hmm. um, and it just kind of answers both like how my process has changed and what I would tell myself um, is don't delete, uh, don't, de don't delete your writing, don't delete your grief, uh, don't delete those feelings. Um, when I was younger and I would start writing, um, I hated journaling uh, because I wanted, I would, I would find journals from a few years before and I would read them and I would cringe because the writing was horrible. The emotion was over dramatic. I didn't want to go back and remember that. Um, and so I didn't journal. I didn't want to have a record of my unfinished thoughts and feelings. Um, I wanted them to be finished and to be right and to be correct. Um, but um, just what I've learned over the past couple of years and how my process has changed is I do journal now and I, um, you can journal and you can write a poem and you can still go back and you can edit the poem. Absolutely. Like it is a practice. You do have to, um, work at it because it is a skill that you learn. Um, but don't, don't delete uh, those first drafts, don't delete those um, journals and don't delete parts of your story. Don't delete the emotions that you don't want to feel um, because um, they're so very valuable and they're part of your story. Um, the anger is a part of your story. The depression is part of your story. The denial is a part of your story. Um, and um, just being able to integrate all of those and at the same time, know that that is not where your identity is um, to process them and to, um, to be able to express them in a way that is healthy, um, is so very valuable. And sometimes not everybody needs to read the, the rough drafts. Not everybody needs to be in those raw vulnerable moments with you. Um, but identifying safe people who need to hear that. And sometimes just in my own process, um, I get to a place where I've processed it enough that I know that somebody else needs to hear the rough shaft. And um, I can publish that, I can share that on my blog um, because at that point it's processed within me, it's not my identity um, and I can share it for somebody else's benefit. I'm not, I guess what I'm saying is make, making sure you have the right intention when you're being vulnerable because we can be vulnerable too soon and that can be very damaging to ourselves it can be damaging to the people that we are sharing with so just being um aware of your intentions and your needs asking yourself what am i needing when i'm sharing this um and identifying those people who are able to meet that need um so sometimes it, the internet is not able to meet most needs. <laughs> so if you're about to publish a poem um, and you're needing deep human connection, then maybe consider sharing that poem with somebody before it gets there. Um, so yes, I think that's it. Just, just don't, don't delete the parts of the story um, and don't delete your emotions and don't delete your rough drafts. Thank you so much, Alexa. And I made a note of that because I have a, I too have a bad habit of uh, <laughs> deleting my early drafts. And I think that that's a good reminder for me not to, uh, not to do that. I think all of you um, have great advice for your younger self, but also for people of all ages, uh, for younger people watching as well as adults um, who are, who are tuning in today. Um, so I don't think that there are, oh, there is one question in the Q and A. Um, do you have any recommendations for certain writing classes or programs? Um, and um, we can we can address that. And I also want to remind anybody that um, is viewing, we do have a few minutes. If you have a question that you would like um, that you would like to ask, please do put it in the Q and A. Um, and then we'll circle, circle circle back around with one of our questions too. Does anybody have any writing programs or classes they would 
you want to recommend? I think Zelda does. Yes. Yeah. Um, this so over quarantine, there was um, I had a, had a lot of free time, um, and so I would just go on the web and like search for readings. Um, one of the things that I'll say is the Idlewild Summer program is free, I believe. I think it's technically for adults. I was 17. Uh, and it's just like a registered event listening to people talk. Ed Skoog and Matthew Dickman speak, and they're my two favorite poets in the world. So it was amazing to see them in conversation. But another thing I would recommend is A, YouTube interviews, um, and B, just looking up readings uh, at universities, typically. The Kelly Writers House, where I work, I record these events. Constantly, there's speakers coming in. So most universities have a uh, reader series or something like that. Also Modpo, sorry, I'm talking a lot. Modpo by Alfil Reese, the University of Pennsylvania, another thing. Uh, that's a course on contemporary modern poetry that's free for everyone. And it has like 15,000 active per participants and discussion boards, sorry. No, thanks, those are great resources. Thank you for sharing them. Um, do uh, Darius or Alexa, do you have a, something that you'd like to recommend or? Yeah, I um, I have a few. I I was also always on I was always on the uh, on the search, on the lookout for these things. Um, I think I I also went to an arts high school called Interlochen, uh, and that is just an awesome place, um, as I'm sure Idlewild is. Uh, and I they also have summer programs um, uh, that are like a novel writing workshop that's two weeks. Um, they have, uh, and they always have an incredible writer doing that. Um, and this is for high school students. Um, and then also, if you if you really want to go study the arts for a prolonged period of time, um, applying to the academy um, is something that you can do. I that, that's bigger um, life changes, but uh, smaller. I, I I was part of a um, for younger writers. I was um, a mentor this summer um, in the inc incandescent studio which is uh, completely free. Um, and this is for like 11 to 14 year old writers. And I had a really wonderful experience in men mentoring an amazing young student. Um, and that's something that I would recommend. And then finally, the, uh, the adroit summer uh, mentorship is, um, they, they pair you with a really accomplished poet uh, for the summer and it's often online. Um, I think it always is online and that's, uh, that's a really great program as well. Yeah, there's a lot of youth summer programs. I went to the Kelly Writers House one two summers ago. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that online. That's very fun. Also, I didn't go to Idlewild, and, uh, but I went to the governor's school. And we, I like to think of Interlochen as like our competitor or like rivals. So like, no, uh, we're friends, the community. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do have a couple of really great questions in the Q and A now, um, and um, I want to uh, I want to highlight Nicole's. Um, so Nicole asks, "How have you responded to getting rejected or losing competitions, especially when it involves something so personal? How do you respond, um, taking it personally?" So how have you responded to rejection? Mm -hmm. I guess I can talk a little bit about this. Also, but yeah, anyone jump in. Um, I think this is a fun question because um, in high school, and in retrospect, this is very silly to me. I'm only a college freshman, but um, I was obsessed with getting published um, because I was in a very naturally competitive place I was at an arts high school um, and all of my friends it felt like were getting published um, and then I won the scholastic uh, portfolio and I was very excited about that um, and definitely gave me a sense of validation I, I'm not going to deny that but um, I like I've said I've been trying to work very hard on my fiction about for like a year or so now and in my mind it's not so much up to the standards of my poetry and my nonfiction. Um, and for me, it's, I haven't really sent out anything uh, in a very long time because, and here's, here's the secret, um, if you're as young as me, it doesn't matter, you don't need to get published. <laughs> um, the easiest way to avoid rejection is not 
send things out, which sounds like a cop out, you can send things out. Um, and I encourage it. Um, don't feel like you need to definitely don't at all. Um, because it is, yeah, it's kind of a bad feeling to get rejected all of the time, <laughs> which I'm not saying, uh, the way to cope with that is, I don't know, don't, don't be too hard on you, but you can also just not send things out if that's not what you're interested in, because you will get, the harsh reality is you will get rejected and that's, and that's, that's not meant to be a discouragement. It's also meant that um, your, your only source of validation does not have to be journals, publications, awards, contests. It can be, for me, what I'm thinking of right now is I'm, I'm working on, I'm working towards improving my fiction. Um, and I think that that, if I was worried right now about sending that out somewhere, um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be constructive. It wouldn't be helpful because then I'd, I'd be in a, in a place that where I'd be doubting my fiction where I, instead of working towards improving it, if that makes sense. So if you want to avoid rejection, don't send it out in the first place, <laughs> but also do also do. But also do. <laughs> my takeaway from that is really, um, a good way to deal with it is maybe taking a break and working on your craft and focusing on that and recognizing that uh, finding the internal validation um, can be can be a part of the the process at that time. Um, <laughs> I, I, don't know I, I have a tricky way with words, but yes, that's it. <laughs> I don't know if that was a valid way. Of right, that's right. <laughs> um, we are we are just at eight o'clock, um, so. Dina, can you um, can you let me know if <laughs> if we have time for one question or if this is the hard stop? I think we can keep going if everyone's okay with that. But I think we should wrap up. You know, in the next five or ten minutes. Just respect everyone's evening. It's Thursday. There's still more things to do tomorrow. But um, yeah, go ahead. Yes, absolutely. Um, so um, we have some interesting things in the Q and A. Um, Jamie Lee shared. Uh, I really like what Alexa just said about vulnerability and how we can meet our needs through sharing or not sharing our work. I'd love to hear what Zelda and Darius have to say um, about how they go about this. And I actually think that Zelda just touched on that um, when answering that previous question. Yeah. Uh, so it's when uh, when sharing my when sharing our work specifically. Um, yeah, I think I think uh, for me sending out work, I, I started doing that um, very young as well, and started getting very hurt feelings um, very quickly. <laughs> uh, and I think that um, yeah, especially when it's something so um, so personal, so much pressure there put on yourself. Um, to do well and to have it be good and when you're getting um, a kind of a form rejection from a journal, you know, it's, it can be really hard. Um, I think I just, I, uh, I do send out um, often and I still do because well, one of the things I really do um, like about it is it, you know, one day, hopefully as a writer, you know, um, you'll succeed in whatever way that you feel is success, like whatever way you've defined success. And I think, um, you know, uh, that can be personal and then also, um, you know, in, in the form of a book or, you know, something like that. And I think uh, once you do have a book, it, you get to have your voice um, kind of living in a space um, with, with different variations of your voice and uh, your, your maturation of your voice. And I think that's a really important um, kind of uh, collection uh, and a po po collections of poetry are really beautiful for that reason. I also think uh, journals are really interesting because they bring together a community um, of voices, which is um, exciting. It's kind of like little anthologies every, you know, so often that, um, that, bring, that bring these poets together. I think that's what I've always, um, you know, rather than thinking about it, in terms of um, if I don't get into this journal, then uh, my poem wasn't good. Uh, you know, I think like I think about it as this was um, this wasn't the right thing for this collection of voices potentially, um, and also maybe it still needs a little work or something. I don't know, but I I think that um, yeah, I think I think that definitely first things first, you need to 
find kind of uh, peace within yourself if you're going to send out that that you know if you get a rejection it does not mean it's not a reflection of the quality of your work in any way uh, that writing is completely subjective um, and the analysis of writing is subjective and I think like also um, I think for me that helped one thing that helped was just making the submission process uh, com like kind of robotic in my mind just like I'm going to submit to this journal and this journal and this journal and that that was that's what I was going to do that you know and the rejections come in and send out somewhere else you know and there are so many great places for your work to live uh, you know in community with other with others and I think that um, you know just don't don't put too much pressure on yourself uh, or an expectation when you send out yeah so not too much pressure and just keep moving forward just try yeah. again They're always right I think right uh, for necessity uh, for like Writing should be something that you feel is necessary for yourself, not necessarily, not something that you feel like uh, maybe you have the talent in and you need to, you need to then show off your talent, you know, and I don't think that many writers are doing it because of that reason. Um, and certainly, hopefully, you know, when you're writing about your grief, that's not something that you're um, thinking too much about. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Um... So one question um, that we didn't get to ask yet, a few of you have uh, experienced working in grief programming and education with young people um, who've lost somebody close to them. So from your experiences as teens and as mentors, what do you think is important for adults to keep in mind when supporting teens who are grieving? Um, so, yeah, so I... I think one of the biggest things um, that we need the adults in our lives to understand during that time is a lot of times in childhood bereavement, um, the parents are probably also grieving too. Um, so in my situation, um, my parents were grieving the loss of their son. And so I really needed the rest of the adults in my life to realize um, that my parents were out of commission, <laughs> that um, their plates were full and that they, um, even though I didn't know, have the words, I didn't have the language of grief. I didn't have the language of psychology. I didn't know how to ask for, um, hey, can you come out and support me at my next concert? Hey, can you come do this with me? Hey, can you um, just be present in my life? Hey, can you help me do my homework? Um, I didn't have those practical things to ask the adults in my life. Um, so, adults, especially in the school setting, um, just need to recognize um, that the adults, the grieving student has leaned on for most of their life is probably out of commission as well. And that it is okay and that it is all right for them to ask, what are you needing today? Is there anything I can do? It's okay to step up um, in, that, in that capacity in really, really practical ways. Um, because especially with childhood bereavement, like this is probably the first major loss that that child is going through. And so they don't have life experience just to ask those questions. They don't know to say um, that, hey, my emotions change in waves every single day. And that's because of grief. Um, because a lot of times that's get, that gets written off as being a teenager. Um, and so a lot of times I just see with the children that I get to work with now at a grief center is their, their adults aren't recognizing their grief as grief. They're blaming it on a stage of development. So they're saying, oh, you're a teenager or, oh, you're just a young, crazy kid in elementary school. That's why you're acting this way. Um, and so, but recognizing that, no, this student is grieving. And as the adult who's not grieving, it is my responsibility to be the adult in that situation um, and just being able to step up and uh, take responsibility, even though you necessarily have no, uh, like you may not have been a huge influence in that child's life beforehand, but you have the responsibility and capacity as, as just a human to provide that relationship now. Um, so it's, it's the message that adults need to hear in that situation is you are fully equipped, you are empowered, you can enter that situation and you do have what it takes. And the best thing you can give that child is um, a listening ear 
and an open heart just to hear their story and to not write it off as, oh, they're okay. Oh, they're, they're a happy three-year-old like Darius shared as part of his um, story um, or, oh, they're just a teenager. Um, so just being able to see and recognize and put those pieces together. Yeah, thank you. Great advice. Um, Zelda or Darius, do you have any advice that you'd like to add to adults that are working with um, uh, with children or teens who have, have lost somebody? Um, yeah, I haven't particularly worked with um, young people on grief, but I've been somebody who's grieving and then had of course. adults work with me. Um, and I can tell you, I can tell adults what I like and what I don't like, which is that um, you, and, and I think Alexa was sort of getting at this, but I mean, specifically in a creative um, space is, is, is what I'm thinking of um, related to grief. Um, I'm very adverse to, I call it like uh, trauma pining or like pining for trauma. Um, and I, I mean this in the sense that um, I think a lot of the times there's a separation of work from author that, you know, oh, we're critiquing the piece, we're not critiquing the author, which is true to an extent. And this is, I'm, this is geared more towards like a, yeah, again, like a, a creative sort of space. But um, if you're right, if, if, you're, if you're a mentor to someone who's, writing a lot about grief or something, I think that um, the mindset is to wed the, the piece and the author a little bit. Um, not as, I mean, you know, don't, don't not give any critiques or something like that, but um, it's it, writing about grief, dealing with grief is a lot different than, uh, I don't know, writing about so, like fantasy or something like that, you know? I mean, not that fantasy can't deal with grief, but, um, yeah, I just think that there has to be a level of cognizance that's there um, and to not push, definitely not, not to not push. That's very important. Um, and not, not, not go searching for st stories that are, that can be harmful. A lot of the times, you know, the advice I received at my high school was write what's interesting, which I in part agree with, but a lot of kids sort of mistranslated that and thought that the the thing the the most hurtful things in their life were the most interesting which I don't I that's not true um there are plenty of interesting things that are not hurtful uh that are not painful to recall um and as an adult I think that you have to uh make that very explicit um when you're teaching writing when you're dealing with young kids uh the most interesting things are not necessarily the things with the most conflict or the things that are the most painful or harmful, like I said, so yeah, it's yeah. my advice. That's great advice. I think that's great advice. Yeah, and I think I just to add on to, I think you can, uh, yeah, I've been, I think uh, from an early age was told that I, uh, I had a story, um, to write and very you know the implication there is that the story that I have to write and that I that I have to write um is is the one of um kind of a a kid who was left behind um and I think that that narrowed kind of my thought process about what I could write about what I could possibly um like the potential of my writing um was kind of narrowed by that by mm. feeling like I had a responsibility um to write not only my story uh but um the story of my mother's and the story of my grandparents my, my father and actually I do end up writing a lot of that um I think we talked touched this on this in the beginning but that everything I write kind of swerves back to that and in some way uh whether it's a more like general Kind of like a lot philosophical piece that's um, thinking about the world that I mean the garden snail poem certainly didn't start with me thinking it would be uh, some kind of some kind of metaphor for 
uh, who I am and how I live um, after grief, but most more so just I wanted to write about uh, a moment where I failed to keep something safe. Um, and I think that it all, I, I, th I think like, I think one of the, one of the sentences that I like kind of that mantras I live by that's uh, uh, by Ross Gay as well. This is like um, the intolerable makes life worthwhile, um, which is both very interesting in thinking about like, okay, um, what we've experienced, like the suffering, trauma, whatever, um, does does make other does inform other moments of of joy, um, but also that um, all all moments are kind of like touched by this, like intolerable, even if we're trying to trying to touch that or not, um, and like kind of thinking about like um, I don't know, just just yeah, I guess like for people working in 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 um, grief settings, I think absolutely with Zelda said not pushing a kid to write about or about their grief explicitly explicitly um and to just offer kind of a relationship and um a space in which that might happen naturally um but also understanding that whatever they write is informed by um the experiences that they've had and um that's i think that's really important So all of you have shared a lot of uh, great advice and wisdom, and thank you for sharing your personal experiences and processes and stories. Um, I think we are 15 minutes past time, um, <laughs> so we should wrap it up. Um, but I, I really want to um, I want to thank you and and just acknowledge how beautiful your work was, how special an experience it was to be able to um, have this dialogue with you, to hear you read your works in your voice, um, and um, it's been a, a really really a, a special experience for us. Um, so now I want to pass the mic to um, Dina so that um, we can thank our sponsor and the New York Life Foundation. Sure. Um, thank you again all so much for coming. Um, such like incredible, amazing thoughts from someone who's, uh, I guess, 30 to give by my age, but also lost a parent as a teenager. And um, I really want to just thank uh, this perspective that you're offering young people. I think it's really valuable. And, you know, we all wish we had it. So we try to be the models we can for others. Um, I know that there might be other questions about the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. I'll let you know that we'll be sending out a follow-up email probably at the beginning of next week uh, with information on how to apply and the New York Life Scholarship, uh, which is sponsored by the New York Life Foundation. There's some information up with them uh, on the screen. I'll also be sharing some um, resources they've created in honor or in uh, respect for Children Grief Awareness Month, which is the month of November. Um, so if you're looking for other kind of grief resources, uh, just for yourself, if you're a younger person or if you're an adult and you want to have some resources to talk with people, um, we'll be sending those out as well. So um, if you do have questions uh, about this class of art and writing awards about applying, though, you can email us at info at artandwriting.org. And again, we'll send this out an email if you're here or you were here at some point, you will get that. Uh, some other folks are also coming in late. Uh, I will remind people that we're going to send out a recording of this to everyone who registered. So if you had a friend who couldn't come, they will be able to get uh, a recording of this posted on YouTube. Um, thank you again all so much for coming, uh, and I hope you have a lovely evening. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys.